There are those who, when they stop to think about people incarcerated in this province, don't want anything to do with them. That is absolutely not the case with Phyllis Taylor. She is a certified life and mediation coach who has worked with Ontario's Ministry of Correctional Services for the past 10 years. She's counseled thousands of people behind bars, earning her the nickname, which happens to be the title of her book. It's called The Prison Lady. True stories and life lessons from both sides of the bars. And Phyllis Taylor joins us now. Great to have you here. Thank you, Steve. I'm you honored what, to be here and couldn't wait to have this interview today. Well, well uh, ditto, because you've had one hell of a life. And I, we're, I have. We're <laughs> going to get into that. It all started with Oprah, right? It started with Oprah. We could certainly say it started with Oprah. And that was as a result of being terminated from a 30-year position as a legal professional. So what happened at Oprah? She comes and does this big show in an arena. You show up, and what do you, what do you learn? I attended... Oprah's life class in Toronto. I went there kicking and screaming. I had no reason to be there. And here I find myself with 20,000 Oprah-inspired in folks and, and me who really didn't want to be there that day. What was beautiful about that day is it was pivotal and it was magical. She had Skyped in six women from a penitentiary in Indiana. And although Bishop T.D. Jakes was speaking, Tony Robbins, Yolanda Vicente, and of course our beloved Oprah, I was fixated on the women from Indiana. What do you think clicked there? Why, why did that happen? Do you know, I came from a very humble beginning. I was incarcerated in my own home, so I was locked up for a year. I was severely abused as a child, mm, just if my war marks were anywhere under A++. Hmm. And for having told the whitest of lies, I would be, I would be beaten and I would be, uh, as I say, I was incarcerated for a year. That was as a result of sneaking out the bedroom window. <laughs> We're talking about your dad here. Yes, my dad. I was a scapegoat child. My brother could run faster, so he was never affected. And my mom wasn't hurt physically either, but emotionally she was crippled and couldn't help me. So while mm. she sat in the corner um, crying and dealing with migraines, I, I was getting abused. So you go to this Oprah event, you, dis you leave this event deciding that you want to have your next mission in life be improving the lives of prisoners. How do you even begin to start doing that? As I sat in the audience that day, Steve, those prisoners were speaking to me, and I literally slapped my knee, jumped out of my seat, and eureka, I was screaming, holy F, this is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Um, I went home, got to sleep as quickly as I could, made my bed, got up the next morning and called every prison that I thought I could drive to in a 20 kilometer radius. And you know how they say diamonds are a girl's best friend? Mm -hmm. Not so much. Google is. <laughs> and after okay. a couple of weeks, I got my first call back from one Lori Shank at the uh, Metro East Detention Center. And she really didn't want to have anything to do with me. And so she said, well, what is it you do? And I said, I I'm a motivational speaker. I hadn't really been a motivational speaker, but I had been a public speaker and competitive speaker all my life. And she said, well, you know what? What is it, what is it you do here? And I said, well, I, anger management, I'll, I'll be talking about anger management. She said, come on in, come on in and meet with me. Bring your resume, get dressed up. We'll see you at one o'clock on Monday. I thought that sounded good. I had no idea what was going to happen. Well, all right, take us on the next leg of the journey, which is you show up, you're in a room full of prisoners, I guess, or? Oh, oh no, no, no. I, uh, I showed up at the uh, control desk and I was met there by Lori Shank and Lori Shank was delighted to see me. As it turns out, and there is a connection between my former manager and Lori Shank. And by the time I arrived, she said, come on in. I know what we're going to do with your program. Well, this is what I meant. I was sort of moving you along to the next thing, which is, okay, I know what we're going to do with your program, which was what? Well, she and I had agreed that I would come in and teach the guys anger management. But we are now talking about Metro East as a detention center. That's very different than a, than a long-term prison. Men and women who are in detention have been charged. They have been convicted, but they don't necessarily know what's going to happen to the rest of their life, how long they're going to be in prison and what, what term and where they're going to be placed and where they're going to be classified. So... They aren't that interested in anger management at that point, and it was 
they were really good at doing musical chairs. They brought me in, put me into a room, table is nailed down to the floor, chairs are movable. And I said to the guys, you know what? There's four chairs, there's four of us, and that there's four of you and one of me. So how about we do musical chairs? After 20 minutes, you stand up and change chairs. They did great with the musical chairs, but anger management, not so much. When you walked into that room and you see guys who are behind bars after all, how yes. scared were you? Not at all. Why not? I was so excited. <laughs> I was just delighted to be there. So it wasn't just that simple. They walked four men in. The guards, two guards, walked four men in, and they are in their finest orange garb, and they're shackled, their hands, their feet, and they are patted down, and I'm watching. And that was kind of interesting, but I was just so excited to be there. This was my first time in a prison, so I couldn't wait to impart whatever knowledge I had to these men. How'd you know what to say? That is an excellent question. It's, again, Google. I have been a journalist and a speaker all my life, public speaking competitor, and when I was researching for, I called it Breaking Bad, it was anger management. So mm -hmm. pretty name, same old topic. All the research, I did all the research. And then of course I wrote a booklet, because I wrote a booklet for every topic I had taught. And uh, we went by that. They read pieces, I had them take turns as you would at any kind of a service. <laughs> I had them read pieces, and then we would talk about them. I think what's certainly one of the things I found fascinating about the book is that while people might expect that you would run into some pretty tough customers there and that there would be scary moments and that when you start probing, they might come at you, there's actually been precious little of that, hasn't there, over the course of your efforts? I had one unfortunate incident with someone who did attack me. But just one. But just one in 10 years. Yeah, of the thousands of people yes. you've ministered to. Yes. One. Do you want to know why? Go ahead. When you go into an establishment, any establishment, but even a prison, even in working with prisoners, if you come in with respect and kindness, and hope, that's what you get back instantly. It isn't something that has to build. I don't come in and have to build a relationship with these men or women. I come in and I give them Phyllis. And when I come in and I give them Phyllis and they see my excitement for being there, they see my respect towards them, they see how I talk to them, how I treat them, how I give them a little bit of hope, even in the darkest of situations, they want that. I am their Oprah. Hmm. What kinds of crimes have the men committed that you are dealing with? Everything from white collar fraud to drug dealing to prostitution, drugs of course, and murder. Murder two. And everything, murder one, and everything in between. <laughs> I, I meant murder I as know, well. I know. You're funny. I see what you did there, <laughs> Phyllis. That was good. That was good. And, and why do you think... Why are they open to whatever it is that you tell them? Let me explain something that's really important about the system. So I have been working in five of our Ontario prisons. One prison in particular, which I, I get into in great detail, is called the Ontario Correctional Institute in Brampton. In Brampton, yeah. And this is one of three treatment-centric prisons in all of Ontario, three. It concentrates on sexual abuse. And that's where I spent a lot of my time. But what's interesting is the men have to apply through their lawyers to be accepted. In exchange, they have to give up any chance of early parole and they have to give any time for time earned for good behavior. But what do they get? They get education, they get decent food, they get respect because there's zero tolerance for disrespect and they get a Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about the women now because yes. it's one of the things that I learned about in your book is that when a woman is released from prison, mm. they basically hand her, I mean, it, not exactly this, but essentially they hand her a subway token and that's it. You know, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And and you tell us that they have to, I mean, if they don't have a ride, they're turning tricks already on the street once again in order to try to get a lift to wherever they've got to get to. Yeah, it's sad. What, what, do, we, what do we do about that situation? We have to take a look at it. We have to make sure it doesn't happen. And we have to fund these women for 
there's so much more involved. This is so many layers of complexity. It's not just the women, but specifically what you're talking about. And, and these are stories that are told to me uh, by the women themselves, that they are given a ticket and they can't even make their way home, but the very intelligent cab drivers or taxis or, or, who, or who have you uh, are lining up because they know where to be and when to be there. And in order to get all the way home, because they're they're in Milton, this prison that I worked with is in Milton. They have they maybe have to get to somewhere in Toronto, and you can imagine what a, a token gives them. So they have learned how to get home by turning tricks. So they are already on the lo- wrong side of the law from the time they get out of the prison gates, and if they have no proper training in the prison, no other way of making a living, and no familial support, they're back and forth and back and forth like a revolving door. And it's it's extraordinarily sad. Many of the chapters in your book focus on individuals that you have yes. dealt with over the years. So yeah. I want to ask you about a few of them if we can right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Destiny. Tell us Destiny's story. Destiny was a prostitute and a poet, a very brilliant woman. She was also assigned to be my assistant So every prison puts me through a check, like I'm going undercover for the FBI, puts me through extensive training, and gives me an assistant. The assistant is fantastic, because I can make friends with these people like in record time, and I can really bond with them and give them hope. Destiny was born in a biker home and never met her dad. He had taken off pre-birth, and her mom was not really fit to be a mom and decided that she had better things to do with her life. So Destiny's mom left her in the biker home to be raised by, I believe it was the Hells Angels. So obviously she didn't have the upbringing that you or I might have. Even though I had some unfortunate situations, I still had a lot, a lot more than she would. And uh, she turned to prostitution as a way of making a living. But she also became my friend. And she sat me down as she was leaving the prison. This is somebody else's favorite story, so I'm going to just give you a a brief synopsis of what happened. She said, can we go speak somewhere privately? She took me into the laundry area. For that, for her, that was private. And she said, you know, I'm leaving here, but I want to warn you, you're friendly and you're kind and you think everybody's okay. And that's okay in here, because we've got guards and you're protected. But when you get outside and you bump into any of us, Do not approach. Do not speak to us, including me, because you never know who's high on drugs, and I don't even trust myself, is what she told me. I have kept in touch with her, which is breaking the rules. You're not supposed to. I am not supposed to. For my own safety, I'm supposed to uh, divest myself of any any interaction with any of these uh, human beings. Are you going to get in trouble for fessing up to this here? I'm not worried about it. Okay. I don't care. Um, How's she doing? that's, That's it. I've kept in touch with... I've not seen her. I, she friended me on Facebook. I accepted her friendship. This is one I haven't seen. And I am so proud to say that she has an extraordinarily happy ending because she has gone back to school. And I want to leave the very, very ending for readers. But I do want to say that it's an extraordinarily happy ending that she has turned her life around and actually gives me this much credit. So I'm, I'm taking it. Let, let's, let's dive a little deeper on that. You have ministered to... What, thousands of prisoners over the years? Well, it's been 10 years, and so I think that uh, I had three shifts a week. I had one regular shift at the Ontario Correctional Institute, where they called it Motivational Mondays, and two shifts in the women's prison, Vanier Correctional Institute in Milton. My point is, or my question is, how many happy endings are there over the years? I don't get to track them. I don't really know. I get asked that question all, all the time. Are there metrics? Are there statistics? Do you know what has happened to, to these people? Yeah, like, how do you know that you're having a positive impact? I know, I know this, Steve. I know that when they're in front of me, just like I'm in front of you now, I know that what I'm saying is resonating with you, and it, it could even make a difference. But I, beyond that moment, I don't always know, hmm. which is part of the reason that I've kept in touch with about a half a dozen. Because in one in particular, one in particular that I, I was life coaching on, on my way home from prison every Monday. And uh, I, don't, I don't know beyond that what happens to them unless I do keep in touch with them. The ones I have kept in touch with have turned their lives around. So maybe that's a marker because they don't share that stuff. Remember, I've been a volunteer. Mm-hmm. So they don't tell me what happens and what the statistics are. I can also say that even though there's a revolving door with a few of them who I've seen visit and revisit me, 
that's not that common. It's interesting that you, you started our conversation by saying you really do love them, but there was one, uh, you don't love all of them, Phyllis. No, you know? no, I don't. Harold. Have uh, I got the I guy's you're name? you're talking about Harry. Harry. Harry, who sexually abused his granddaughter. Yes, it was, it was. Okay, a, you don't love him. No, I don't. And in fact, you try, you know, when he was feeling sorry for himself and saying my family wants to disown me, you know, say, say something to me to make me feel better and, and to ingratiate myself with them, you gave him some tough love, didn't you? Well, you know what? Here's what I think. I am in the prison to do good. And there are, as I said, the Ontario Correctional Institute deals with an awful lot of sex offenders. I don't love them all. And I understand that in my heart, too, not just cognitively, but in my heart, I know that some people can be rehabilitated, while others perhaps not so much. I'm not sure about Harry. I'm not sure whether he could be re... And I'm not the professional who's going to make that decision. No, but he wanted you... But what he to, wanted... To, ...to get involved and to, to tell his kids, give Grandpa a break and allow him to be back in the family. And instead, they said, you instead, get Instead, I said to him, listen to me very carefully. Mm -hmm. I understand your family. You are lucky that anyone's even taken... Uh, given you the privilege of speaking with you even long enough to tell you not to come back. Mm. I need you to do what they want and do what they say and stay away from them. And in that moment, I thought to myself, I'm here to help these prisoners, but sometimes I have to help someone else. Mm. And I believe with my heart, my soul, and everything I have that I might have made a difference for his family because he's going to stay away. Mm. I mean, this guy was at his granddaughter. Yeah. And I have granddaughters. Do you, in the course of your travels, find people who are completely irredeemable and you just, you don't even want to be in the same room as them? That's the only man that comes to mind, who we just discussed. Just him, Harold. Yes, and there's more like him that I may or may not have met, but mm -hmm. just that particular type of person. I mean, I dealt with Josh, who was a serial rapist. And at the end of my lesson on forgiveness. It, it was forgiveness that day. Uh, I have, as I said, I, I write a booklet. Mm -hmm. He must have taken a page out of my booklet, turned it around, and on the back he wrote me a note. This is Josh. He wrote me a note and he said, how am I ever to forgive, be forgiven or ask forgiveness from the people I've harmed when I have spent a quarter of my life, he was about 40, so for about 10 years of his life he has been a serial rapist. Mm -hmm. How can I ask forgiveness of these people for the damage I have done to them and for the damage I've done to everyone else who loves them? Now, these are my words, not his, but close enough. And it's in the book. The exact note is in the book that he wrote me. And that was a tough one. I didn't know what I was going to say to him. But the thing with this guy is he showed remorse. Harry, not so much. But the difference is remorse. And when there is a person who's made a mistake, even if I've made a mistake, if I, if I apologize sincerely and I show remorse, that deserves something. So I went home and thought and thought and researched and thought. And there's a story of, of some enlightenment that came to me through, through lunch with a friend. Everything is divine intervention, or as we say in Yiddish, beshert. Meant to be. Meant to be. And I was having lunch with a, with a friend and she was divulging something very personal to me. And I said, kind of in different words, but it was kind of like, holy crap, how do you live with yourself? How are you making this okay? And why aren't you feeling shame or guilt? And they're different. And she said, I am being the best I can every day in every way with layers and layers of kindness. So I went back into the prison the next week and when the lesson was over, I called Josh aside and I said, I've been thinking about you an awful lot and I know what we're going to do. You can be forgiven and you can forgive yourself. Here's the plan. You're going to be the kindest person that you can imagine every single day from here on in. Because you know what? When you know better, you can do better. <laughs> and I have to believe that I know that I made a difference. He, he, he had an awakening in that moment. And I know in that moment he got it, he bought it, and he was going to take it home with him. But I'm fascinated by the choreography here because on the one hand, you're asking these, some of them, very hard-edged criminals to get very introspective and deep and emotional 
which they might be happy to do with you, but as soon as they leave that room, they're, they're you know, they're back with serious business. How do they do that and not worried about getting beaten up when they're, when they're no longer with you? I don't have the answer to everything, hmm. but I can tell you that they weren't just taught forgiveness. They were taught friendship. They were taught compassion. They were taught kindness. They were taught happiness. They were taught passion and purpose. And I believe that with all these lessons, I mean, I have a year-long repertoire that I repeated every year, mm -hmm. that with all these lessons put together, and of course I can't reach everybody, and of course not everybody has the mental and uh, uh, emotional and uh, intellectual capacity to get it, mm -hmm. but there are those who do. There may be a sense among the general population that people who want to volunteer to go into prisons to hang out with some of the most dangerous people in our world are a little crazy themselves. <laughs> so, so I guess my, my last question is, if people do want to be helpful in this regard, how do they approach it? If anybody feels that they want to make a difference by doing volunteerism in any discipline, in any path, and they see a couple of obstacles, or they see some challenges, or they think that they're not up for the job, go for it anyway. Because if it is meant to be, you will find a way. And if you have the courage and the passion and the desire, you can make it happen. I did. You sure did. And it's all here in uh, 250 so pages. The Prison Lady, True Stories and Life Lessons from Both Sides of the Bars. Phyllis Taylor, great to meet you, and thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you, Steve. It's been an honor and a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.